And that was my presentation. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're here to have some fun today. And we're here to learn. And we're here to talk about leadership. And we're all here to grow. I've learned a lot this morning just listening to all of the other presenters before me. And today I'm going to take a slightly different approach. And I'm going to start by asking a question, which is what do we all want to be? Just, you can just shout it out, right? What do we all want to be? Just tell me what you want to be. Great. Successful. Who said that? Paul Ann? Yes. Oh my gosh, star, star pupil in the building. Right? So at the end of the day, everything that we do leads back to wanting to be successful. All right? Round of applause for Paul Ann. And we, did, we didn't plan this, by the way. I haven't seen her in about a year or two years, right? But at the end of the day, we all want to be successful. We want to be, first of all, a successful child, right? We want to make our parents, our guardians proud. We want to be successful parents. We want to raise good kids. We want to be successful people in the workplace. We want to excel. We want to do well. We want to be successful teachers, successful principals. We want to be successful husbands, wives, brothers, sisters. At the end of the day, we, we all want, nobody wants to be a loser, right? Nobody wants to be, what's that guy in the U.S. name again, the former president? Oh, no. It's been recorded, right? All right. <laughs> right, we all want to be successful. So, the question now is, how do we become successful? Right, and what defines success? And John Maxwell was talking about it earlier on, and he was saying, you don't just become successful. You don't, there's no journey. How it go? Let's see if anybody's taking notes. No journey to success. There's a success journey. All right. So, back in the days, and my principal would appreciate this, people tended to measure or anticipate success based on how bright you were. Right? So, as Nesta said earlier on, they say a bright person in the community, a sharp, smart guy, they say, yeah, man, this one likely to be successful. So, they take him under the wing and the community takes him in. Right? So, success was often really seen as a measurement of your intelligence. Right? Or otherwise known as your IQ. So, the brightest picking in the class, most likely to be successful. Right? The ones that gave the most trouble, probably least likely to be successful because they just don't have any behavior at all. And that was a thought process. Over time, what people saw is that many times that bright picnic in the class, always getting straight is most you know, well behaved, all the school prizes, didn't necessarily amount to much in life. Or they didn't necessarily amount to what, we would, what society would deem as being successful. So I started to ask the question, well, is it really your intelligence? Are you really doomed, if you're not intelligent by measurement of IQ, to not being successful? So they did some research, and they played a game, and the game was called a cookie game. So they took a cohort of students, ages 5 to 20 years old, put them in a room. First thing they did is that they, they measured their IQ. And they recorded and scored, you know, who had a high IQ, medium, low IQ. Then they started this game. And there were only two rules to this game called the cookie game. Rule number one is, wait an hour and you get a cookie. Rule number two is, as soon as you eat the cookie, you leave the room. That's it. There's no right or wrong. There's no scoring system or anything at all like that. that that's the only rules that they told them. So they play the game, and, you know, Paula and Porter being the hungry belly that she is, one hour past, she gets her cookie, she just eat it, say, I'm out, I can't bother wait, right? But Erica now starts to say, you know what, well, maybe I could wait two hours, and I might get two cookies. 
three hours, I get three cookies. So let me see how long I can wait, and maybe I can build up and get some more cookies. And I'll you know, share with my friends or family or whatever. So they both took a different approach. Fast forward 20 years later, they took the same cohort and asked them a series of questions as a measurement of success, right? So, you know, did he graduate from school or in a loving, committed relationship? How were you doing financially? Did you have any dependencies? Um, were you on any drugs? Um, how happy were you? Just a set of questions to try and determine success. And there were two things that came out of that study. The first thing was a discovery that there was absolutely no correlation with those that had high IQs to becoming successful. So now I'm going to give you the keys to life. Nobody knows so excited. I've just said I'm going to give you the keys to life. Is everybody excited? Yeah, forget the key first. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So give me a little drum roll now. Give me a little drum roll for the keys to life. So I'm going to give you the keys to life right now. And I promise you, if you follow these keys, your life will never, ever be the same. I didn't read this in a book. I didn't get this off the internet. This is me. My experience over the years of what I've put together as a leader that have helped me to manage my way through. Okay? This is going to help you solve all the problems with your kids, with your co-workers, with your husband, with your boyfriend, with your husband and your boyfriend. <laughs> all right. Keys to life. Key number one. Are you ready? Okay. First key to life. All humans are emotional beings. All humans are emotional beings. From your born, you come out in the world, doctor slaps you two times, you cry, it's a response because it's a new world. You might be hungry, you might be tired, you might be frightened, whatever the case is, you might need to just breathe, but we're all emotional beings and I know in Jamaica especially the men don't think that we're emotional beings as Nesta said earlier we're taught not to cry man a bad man everybody we're all emotional beings I saw John Maxwell tearing up on the screen when he was talking about his assistant giving him the book best book he's ever written and the pages were blank because he's continually writing it okay <clears throat> second key to life Everyone is different. All right, now this is a, I can't even underscore the importance of this enough. Everyone is different. The failing of mankind, in my opinion, is our inability to recognize that we're all different. So what happens is we only judge the world from our perspective. Right? I think that gray is the best color. Erica thinks that blue is the best color. Well, blue can be the best color because gray is the best color. Because that's my perspective. So clearly she's wrong and I'm right because I like gray. That's what causes religious wars. Right? That's what causes marriages to fail. That's what causes problems between parents or guardians and children. Because we, we judge the world from our worldview. That we are right. Somebody else is wrong. One man said Jesus and the next man said Selassie. Who's right or who's wrong? It's a, it's a ridiculous argument. Right? But we, we always think that we are right. Recognize we're all emotional beings and everyone is different. Okay? So we have a problem. We were talking uh, earlier on about intolerance. Right? We have an ability, inability to tolerate others because of their differences. Right? So we're in Jamaica and a man like an next man so he's a T-man. Yeah. Right? Because he's different from us. And so we're uncomfortable with that difference. So we have to name it, label it, put it in a corner because we can't accept that somebody could actually be different. Something must be wrong with them. Right? That's something we have to grapple with and really think through. Third key to life. 
this is, this is what it's all about right here. Emotions drive behavior, not the other way around. Okay? We are a society, we are a world, we're very focused on behavior. Right? You go to the supermarket with your child, they're throwing a tantrum, throw themselves on the ground. What do you say? Get up off the ground. Stop your crying. That's not how we behave. Get up. You're embarrassing me. Stop your foolishness. You want a beating? You want another beating? Right? You focus on the behavior. That behavior that they're displaying, throwing themselves on the ground, is embarrassing to you. It's upsetting to you. Right? But what you're not recognizing is that there is an emotion driving the behavior. So what we try to do all day long is to try and fix behavior. Right? Something is wrong. Emotionally, something is what is driving that behavior. Okay? So to tie it all together now, and this is the biggest key to life. If you can get this, it's game over. If you want to influence or change somebody's behavior, you have to change their emotions. So I'm going to say that again. If you want to change or influence somebody's behavior, you have to change their emotions. Okay? A company called Telecommunications of Jamaica, CNW, they have landlines, they want to introduce cellular phones, they introduce cellular phones, they are expensive, people hate them, the service is horrible. Another company comes into the marketplace, they're called Digicel, the name is as plain as ever, Digicel, digital cell phone, they're very upfront with what they do. They want to influence the market and they want to change people's behavior, they want to get them to buy their product, they want to get them to support them as a company, and so they target their emotions. Digicel is a company that cares. We are here for you. We understand the challenges. We are community-based. We're going to give you products at reasonable prices. We're going to package and bundle things for you to make it easier. Right? And they just took the market by storm. Right? In fact, they were so embedded in Jamaica's culture, right? I worked in marketing several years ago. I was head of marketing at Red Stripe and we seen on a bunch of other places. We used to do surveys and the number one recognized brand, the most liked brand in Jamaica was Digicel. Right? Because they appealed to people's emotions. So good a job they did that there was another company called Claro that came to Jamaica that was backed by the richest man in the world, Carlos Slim, Mexican guy. And they were like, you know what? We're just going to give away phones. How can you compete with that? And people said, no. I'm not going to take your free Clara phone because I have a relationship with Digicel. How powerful is that? Round of applause for that. Right? I'll give you another example from my personal perspective. So I, I worked at Red Stripe for several years. I was in charge of um, Red Stripe, Red Stripe Light, Guinness Heineken, Smirnoff, Smirnoff Ice, Johnny Walker, Tanqueray, Baileys, etc. Right? Worked through all of those brands. Appleton was that number one spirits brand that people drank at all parties. Right? Diageo, own Red Stripe, had a product called Smirnoff. And so my job was to introduce Smirnoff into the marketplace. So we did a lot of research, looked at the market, what they wanted, etc. And we said, you know what? We're going after a younger demographic because Appleton was an entrenched brand. So... We launched with a Smirnoff Ice, right? So we went after, it's called RTD, ready to drink market, with a product that, no, you didn't have to mix. It wasn't up to the bartender how much Appleton they were putting, whether they were putting Appleton and Coke or milk or 
orange juice or whatever thing. It was pre-packaged, you know exactly what you're getting, the exact alcohol content, the exact liquor buzz that you're getting, and we launched that within one year because we were appealing to people's emotions. We knew that the younger generation wanted something that they could connect with. They were no longer connected with Appleton. Appleton was their father's drink grandfather. or grandfather, right? So we launched that. Smirnoff became a hit, right? Thank you. Went as far as, you know, cartel talk about apple vodka we're drinking. Okay? And if you understand this, it's a system that you can use. So I did it again. I went to Wisinko. There was a little brand there called Ocean Spray. Right? Wisinko had been distributing it for 15 years. The brand was growing at maybe 3 4% a year on average. And I said, this, I believe in this brand. This brand has something special. Right? We went through a process. There's a, I'll save it for another session, but there's a marketing process that I go through, a research process it's called the Oracle, which I wrote, and figured out the insight, the emotional insight to connect with people. And the difference was Ocean Spray was seen as something that was good for, it was healthy, right? But here's the distinction, and I'm glad you said that. The rep came down from Massachusetts, Boston, the head office from Ocean Spray and said in a session with my entire team when I asked what is the, the unique differentiator, what is Ocean Spray's position, what are they all about? And she said, Ocean Spray is positioned for females 18 to 24 years old, just out of college or having their first job who have become sexually active and are at risk of getting urinary tract infections. Right? So that's what, was, what cranberry juice was known for. And when she said that, I was like, I hear you, but that has got to be the least sexy brand proposition I've ever heard in my life. Right? So again, with my team, we went through and we said, no, you know something? We can't position this product as medicine. It has to be something that, that fits into what people are doing. So again, ran it through the process and, and the insight that we came up with which is going to sound very simple, but I'm going to decode it, and it's relevant to leadership, right, is people want to live, it actually was Jamaicans want to live healthier lifestyles. They do this by incorporating healthy habits into their existing routine. First thing, Jamaicans. I was differentiated. Our only business is what they're doing in Boston, but it's not going to work here in Jamaica. So we're bold enough to say, no, we have a different culture and a different set of people, and we are going to position it in a different way. We want to live healthier lifestyles. So at the time, people are talking about getting healthy and fitness and all this type of stuff. And they do this by incorporating, so adding it into healthy lifestyles into their existing routine. So we know that people burn weed, them smoke, them drink, liquor, etc. They live bad. And so if you're going to go out and do that, then you may as well chase it with a little cranberry juice to help you feel a little bit better. Right? So we invented a mix called the Berry Buster. And we said, okay, what's the number one alcohol brand in Jamaica per volume consumed? Rare Nevio White Rum. We went to Rare Nevio, came up, created a logo and a brand with a pre-packaged thing with them called Berry Buster and launched white rum and cranberry in the bars. And that's how cranberry really got its first introduction into mainstream. Thank you again. Okay, because nobody wants to be seen drinking a cranberry juice at a party if, if it's going to be synonymous with having a urinary tract infection. <laughs> right? So we changed it around. We innovated. First, I bet William my food my job that I would double sales if he gave me the appropriate resources and stuff to do it. We were doing 300,000 cases, and in 11 months, we're at 800,000 cases. Wow. At the end of two years, we're at 1.4 million cases, and at the end of two and a half years when I, went, when I left, we're at 2 million cases, and Jamaica became the number one cranberry juice consuming country per capita in the entire world. Yeah. Leaders lead, right? And I wasn't afraid to say, no, that strategy that you have is not going to work. 
And I could have just been like, no, it's just let me keep my job, let me just follow it. But I was leaders lead. So I said, no, I have a vision, I have a clear strategy, and this is what we're going to do. Right? No, well, I don't, I left a long time ago. So, but cranberry juice, ocean spray is still like a household brand in Jamaica. Right? And I did the same thing again. I'll save it a long story, but the same thing with water, WATA water. When I went to Isinco, there was really only one water brand in Jamaica, and that was Catherine's Peak. Right? You had a couple of other cool run ins and one or two others, some from Mobay and stuff. Water was like get a man's water with some chlorine tablets from Riverton City. Nobody paid it any mind. So we looked and we said, what can we attach ourselves to? Sports, health, what's the number one sport? Football, what's the number one league? Premier League, sponsored the National Premier League. And again, leadership and innovation. We took the, the same bottle water label and created customized water labels for every single one of the 12 Premier League teams. So you had an Arnett Gardens water, Tivoli Harbour View, Reno, etc., etc., Waterhouse, etc., right? And that was built on an insight, which was Jamaicans support brands that are loyal and support their communities. Right? And so instead of just sponsoring a team, we said to a team, for every case, for actually for every bottle of water that you sell, we'll give you back $1 to the community. Within three months, you went into any inner city community, Catherine speak, missing. Shelf, water from top to bottom. Right? And water became the number one bottled water brand in Jamaica and is still that way 12 years later. <laughs> right? So in order to influence or change somebody's behavior, you have to change their emotions. Right? That is really what I want you to think about for the rest of the day. So what about you? Right, so we're talking about other people, other people's behavior, how they're behaving, how you're going to change and influence their emotions, reading people's minds, all this. But what about you? We're all emotional beings, so you're an emotional being. Too. So the same things are happening to you. What are the things that are impacting your emotions and how are you handling it? So how do we manage our own emotions? First thing, so I want to give you some specific tools. Right, These are important tools. First thing is called square deep breathing, right? Let's look at the screen. Think of it as a square rectangle, four sides. You're going to take a breath in for five seconds at the top. Hold it for five seconds at the side. Exhale for five seconds. Hold it. And then inhale again. And we're going to all do it together, okay? After three. One, two, three. Exhale, hold it, inhale, hold it, exhale. How does that feel? Good. We forget to even breathe sometimes. Right? That's what's keeping us alive. We forget to even breathe sometimes. Right? So and in again in that moment. I'm fully in control of your minds. Everybody just focus on the breathing. So you forgot about whatever other problems or troubles you had in life. In that moment, you're just focused on your breath. That's an exercise that you can do when you're driving after the taxi man running off the road. Square deep breathing. Right? It helps. It really helps. Next thing is give yourself and others time. Right? So now you know it takes 17 minutes after a co-worker, colleague, spouse, child, whatever gets fired up. Right? For them to even start to calm down. And it takes four hours for them to completely settle back down. So give yourself and others time. Same thing is happening to you too. This one is important. Difficult to comprehend at first, but let it sink in. Be passionate, but emotionally disconnected. Yeah. Be passionate, but emotionally disconnected. Okay? What does that mean? It means that... Because we know that emotions are what drive behavior, we have to better manage our emotions. So you have to be able to disconnect emotionally from things sometimes to be able to control your behavior. But it doesn't mean that you can't still be passionate about it. Okay? So you show up to work, you're passionate about it, you want to help the kids, right? You're committed to it. You have did your time at a big, great school before that has done amazing things. You have a new challenge that God has put in front of you. But at the end of the day, it's, 
you have so much control and no more, right? If you throw yourself into it and be so emotionally invested and into it, it will stress you out, right? You may not be able to do anything about cleaning up the gully or the culvert, but you come here, you make a nice presentation, you get the minister's contacts, you can reach out to him. So you're doing things, but at the end of the day, you also have to be able to let it go, right? Some of us, lots of us work at places. You're going to work somewhere again in the next couple of years, right? Focus on what's happening at home. There's no point in going to work and all your focus is just on work, 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 and you think you're doing an amazing job and your home life sucks, right? What are you doing that for? You're not being a hero by doing that, okay? Passionate but emotionally disconnected. And then finally, show gratitude and appreciation. In all cultures, they have some form of prayer. This is why people pray. Right? For those that go to church, you go to church, you say two prayers, you listen to the pastor, you sing two hymns and stuff, you feel good coming out of church. Right? And the reason is, physiologically, the one act that you can do that is proven scientifically to reduce the, the release of cortisol in your body is to show gratitude and appreciation. Just be thankful. Right? So, some practices refer to it as a rampage of appreciation. Right? It's a deliberate act. Somebody said earlier on you can uh, choose to be fearful or not. Right? It's a deliberate. You're driving on the road, somebody bad driving. You have a choice. You can either cuss and go on bad, or you can say, Boy, you know what? Bad driving, but guess what I'm, I'm safe, I'm alive. And in fact, I'm driving. All right? Every morning, whenever I'm going to the gym sometimes, and I'm like, yo, I'm tired. I can't bother with this foolishness again. Sorry, it's an alarm. And I'm, I'm driving, and I'll see somebody walking on the road with a cane. And I'll be like, wow, look at this. I'm here cussing. First of all, I'm driving to the gym, right? And I'm cussing, and this person is walking with a cane. What, what do I have to complain about, really? Okay? So what emotions look like? Emotions are real things. Right? So this is a heat map of emotions. Anger, fear, disgust, happiness, sadness, surprise, no emotion, anxiety, love, depression, contempt, pride, shame, envy. Right? These are 14 emotions. We don't usually think about it as being so complicated. You're either just happy or you're sad or you're angry or you're all right. But there's nuances in between. Now, when I first researched this, the thing that I found most interesting was some of the similarities between some of the emotions. So, you know, if you look at anger, love, pride, for example, so top left, and then on the lower end, the second one and the fifth one. They're not that far off. So what you may think somebody is experiencing or expressing as anger, because remember now, we are seeing their behavior. We know that emotions drive behavior. We're trying to understand the emotion behind the behavior. And so we're saying, well, that behavior is a function of anger. It could really be pride. And in fact, it may really be love. It could even be anxiety. So it gets really complex to try and now understand what is the emotion driving people's behaviors. And then on top of this now, you have you. So how are you reacting? Why are you reacting that way? Are you really disgusted? Or are you really afraid? Or are you really ashamed why you're acting that way? Right? There's another aspect of it too, which is that these emotional files, which are embedded in your amygdala, a lot of them happen before you are five to six years old. Right? So if you are abused as a child, you're not necessarily going to remember that time when you were three years old and your stepfather or something gave you a beating because you were crying and he couldn't sleep. You don't really remember that. You just have like this fear and you're not too sure why. Or maybe you're four or five, you're starting to express yourself. You got a little bit of confidence. And you did a, you did a song and you performed at school and some of the kids laughed at you. 
and you felt embarrassed and that sticks with you but you're not really remembering that when you're 25 years old and you're about to give a speech and you're like why am I so worried oh Alison just go up on the stage and she just talk and she just easy and calm what what I'm like panicking here and it's something that happened to you as a child all right so that whole early childhood development critical because we are teaching our children and we are putting things in their minds early which affect behavior down the road you can't, it's not so easy to adjust the behavior of, a, of a somebody who's 24 years old who decides he's going to take up a gun because you don't know what his life has been like. And then we sit down here and we judge because why? We are always right. The world centers around us, right? We can't, everybody's the same. So if I think that it's wrong to like shoot and kill people, and clearly it must be wrong for them to their evil, but you don't know what they have been through. The research shows that and this is going to blow your mind. The research shows that most of the men who end up committing murders were abused by their mothers as children. Abused by their mothers. So their mother think that she's giving them tough love because their boy picnic must be a man and putting a lot of responsibility on them early and beating them early and young. And so they grow up with this indifference to life right and no father figure to guide them so the question at the end of the day is what is a brand and this also comes into as leaders as everybody in this room is what is your leadership brand and a brand is simply drum roll A collection of emotional experiences. At the end of the day, that is what it's all about. And at the end of the day, that's what leadership is all about. Right? I, I don't know. I'm trying to think. I know Elon might be the oldest person here. I don't know who in here may have. Anybody in here met Michael Manley? You did? Big time. Right? So a couple of people in here, two out of the whole room have met Michael Manley. But if I ask some questions about Michael Manley now, we could go on for an hour. Because of his impact as a leader. Especially in education, right? So he left an impact in terms of his leadership in education. Okay? And it's about emotional experiences. Clearly, emotionally, you can connect, you can res he resonates with it in terms of his impact that he had in education. And other people may have other views. So, and if I was to say Siago or Garvey or Trump or whoever else, <laughs> right, then other people would have different, a different emotional connection with that. If I say Porsche or PJ or Andrew Holness, again, there's an emotional connection. Right? And if I can be non-political, but just being objective, and as a leader and as a marketer, if we look at the recent elections, right, I would say a, 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 a very big part of what led the current administration to win the elections was an emotional connection with its leader. Right? People believe, for the most part, in Andrew Holness and his leadership. Yeah, it might be one or two questions or one or two people, boy, we don't like this, we don't like that, or whatever. But overwhelmingly, the population voted confidently for his leadership right and that's based on a set of emotional experiences and emotional connectors that's that's critical so i don't want us to gloss over that you have a question correct portia simpson miller people voted for her it's a female prime minister they wanted a woman prime minister she connected with the people Right? She hugged everybody, she loved everybody, people trusted her and people believed in her. And she won based on a set of emotional connections, based on her leadership, her leadership at the side. It wasn't based on policy. I don't think anybody could say, oh, well, you know, in terms of crafting of policy, without a doubt, she fought. No, it was just people just liked her. They liked her leadership style. Right? So I want to also, you know, continue to make that, that, that distinction between being a leader and being a boss. Okay? Bosses tell people what to do. 
leaders inspire people to do things. It's a very big difference. And if you want to be a leader, you have to focus on how do I inspire other people to change their actions or reactions? How do I get them to behave in a particular way? And the way to do that is by focusing on their emotions. All right? So always remember this too. You are a brand. You are a leader. You have leadership capabilities within you. And you also have the ability to inspire others to lead. I went away to school for a couple of years when I was younger. And I was given a whole heap of trouble. I was 16 years old and big footballer, captain of the football team and everything. I didn't really feel that I had to you know, abide by any rules. And I was at boarding school. And after the first year, my grades really weren't too, too good. And I got called into the principal's office. And I was like, cannot believe this. My parents sent me all the way up here to go to school in foreign. I also remember driving to school with my dad. I was 13 years old and just become a teenager. I was going to Campion and, you know, thinking through stuff. I was a little bit kind of ahead of my time. I was driving, asking him, I said, Dad, what does it really take to, to become a man? What, is, what does being a man mean? Is it like now that I'm 13, or is it when I get my first girlfriend, or is it when my voice change, or is it when I can grow a beard, or is it when I turn 20, or is it when I can drink, or what's that thing that makes me become a man? And I remember he thought about it for a second. He said, son, being a man means two things. One is knowing what your responsibilities are. And the second is taking care of them. That was it. Another statement that has changed my life. Because he just simplified it. It wasn't about how much money you have, how much gal you have out the road, how, what kind of vehicle you're driving, how much friends you have. None of that. He said, being a man means knowing what your responsibilities are and taking care of them. And I've always followed that and I've tried to live up to that. 